You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Ginta. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of RX Radio. A special one for you this week. I uh, had the pleasure to sit down with Ian Kaplan. Um, Ian, Ka- I kind of did a CT Fletcher thing with our last episode with Ian as the smartest guy you've never heard of, and he's since gotten infinitely smarter. And it's kind of this is the last episode we can do with him because he's at next point he's just going to be speaking Pig Latin or something like that or just talking in C plus uh, plus. But Ian's the COO at Hybrid, uh, super smart guy. We talk morality and technology platforms. We talk uh, a lot about the evolution of the fitness tech space. Uh, Cap's been a close friend. He's actually a chiropractor, believe it or not. You'll have a hard time believing it because he's actually smart, unlike me and Junta. Uh, So he graduated. He graduated from Kaiser this year, but has since taken the role up at Hybrid as managing operations, writing technology, uh, writing the code, making the user experience over at Hybrid uh, that much better. If you guys want to check out Ian, he's Ian Kaplan Fitness. Fuck Cap, I'm sorry. It's in the show notes, um, but he's the man behind the scenes, the guy with the flashlight in the center of the black box that is hybrid. They got some really cool stuff. Just released a program uh, with Matt Frazier, Canadian. Uh, did you know Frazier was Canadian? Yeah, Matt Frazier, Canadian, friend of the show. Matt Frazier will be, uh, yeah, so they just released their Hard Work Pays Off program. Uh, Frazier just uh, retired from CrossFit, is now working exclusively on the programming side with uh, Hybrid. So be sure to check that out. Uh, Prescript courses live right now. Registration for skill acquisition uh, is up on the website. That course goes live at the beginning, late March, early April. Uh, so do jump over there, head into registration. That's www.pre-script.com. Without any further ado, guys, Ian Kaplan, Hybrid Performance Method. See you next week. Welcome to the Ian Kaplan Podcast. You could be the Lex Friedman of fitness. I could be. I would like to be. Thoughts? Why not? You got to get the suit, though. Oh, yeah. I don't have the, the Russian the, the romanticism, though. Yeah, but there's like there's, there's something romantic about like the Northeastern United States Jewish community, though. Yeah, but he ha- he's closer to Russia than, than I am. I'm like four generations removed. Yeah, and you also live in Florida, <laughs> yeah, which no. has no, there's no sanctimony in Florida. Yeah. Florida's the only place that has casual meth users. Yeah. <laughs> like those guys you see that don't have all their teeth and you're like, oh, so that's what a casual meth user looks yeah. like. Like weekends and holidays, that kind of thing. He also has real academic access. He's a dude. He works at MIT. And but like, you went to Palmer. <laughs> I didn't go to Palmer. I went to Kaiser. You went to Kaiser? I didn't even know that was a thing. I think I went to Palmer. No, it's a new thing, and it's not doing so good probably anymore. So wait, your school might not exist? It, it, it was trying to get off the ground, and now with COVID, it, you know, that kind of throws a wrench in the chiropractic education. Yeah, well, COVID <laughs> kind of threw a wrench in the chiropractic profession. Although we got deemed, did we get deemed essential down here? Well, not everything was essential down yeah, here. Yeah. Strip clubs, everything. <laughs> everything stays open. Yay, Florida. Yeah, no. Uh, event, uh, I mean, within a few months, you know, that that wasn't that much of an issue. But When did you become disenfranchised with the chiropractic profession? <laughs> I don't know. Slowly, we, it was not like a moment. It was. A, it was <laughs> it's an arsenic poisoning. It was, like, really. it was like a boiling of the frog scenario. Okay. Do like, explain a, for a, those at home who don't know the boiling of the frog it was scenario. Like, it's like it's, just, it's some analogy. When you boil a frog slowly, it doesn't it doesn't do anything until it realizes that it's being boiled. Like it doesn't notice the changes. You know that the temperature is warm. Like it, it, as it gradually increases temperature. Can I can like, I offer something to you? Yeah. You've lived in Florida entirely too long. <laughs> that is definitely a Florida reference. <laughs> oh man! But yeah, I I, I get it because it's it's funny. I was just recording or I was just teaching like the level one class here, um, and you were sat op- opposite to me, mm-hmm. and you are probably the most daunting intellectual I've ever come across because it's weird because when I meet people who are like dauntingly intellectual when it comes to uh, like the technical side of things like Mm. computer data science and coding and things like that like Mm. Mark Masiri works with us and he was the principal engineer at NASA uh, in the serious engineering yeah in the advanced robotics he now works for Woodside Energy drilling oil out of the center of the earth yeah Um, but when I talk about mechanics and shit 
Mark doesn't know his ear hole from his asshole. Yeah. That, not, he's, he's, <laughs> he's smart, but like, I'm not, I don't want Mark to hear this and get mad at me and like take over my bank account again. We were literally walking down Venice Boardwalk, me and Junta, a few years ago, and we got a text message from Mark. This is when we first started working with him. Oh. It was like, hey, I need credentials for the bank, uh, the, the company bank account. Mm-hmm. And then I checked my phone, checked my phone. I was like, oh, well, fuck, we'll do it later. And then her next text message, text message was, haha, just kidding, got it. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> but you you carry expertise in so many domains, and now your most recent endeavor has taken you all but off the deep end, in my opinion. <laughs> it's like, uh, please explain your transfer of chiropractic into coding and data science. Um, I mean, just working at hybrid and realizing that we're actually a, a software engineering organization in many ways. At, at least some of the core activity is actually building and maintaining software. Um, to get anywhere in in terms of building a platform, you actually have to first learn how those things typically work down to a reasonably low level, right? It's all about abstraction, right? You don't you abstract away the fact that the, you know it's essentially logic gates, but like, right? You need to know how the internet works and how networking works and what is doing, what your application is doing, and all all those things. And there's a lot to learn there. And because you need to connect right the end result to the steps it, that are required to to get to that end result. So and this is why you became demystified with chiropractic. Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that what I'm seeing? <laughs> yeah, there's no magic, right? There can't be magic. Like there's I mean, there's this beautiful kind of you know there's obviously it, it has its own quirks, but there's this beautiful kind of um, kind of merit based kind of. I, you know, meritocracy of ideas in software engineering is like you never do anything because somebody says so, right? You have to explain your reason. You can disagree and commit, but everyone has a voice, and there's no magic, right? If no, if people don't understand how it works, they won't do it because they know that's a recipe for a disaster. And also, they they think through the consequences of of ideas because again, the step after not thinking through the consequence of your of your next decision is is often a really you know terrible side effect because. It's, it's you know when you build kind of these these programs that are essentially executable stories, you need to know how they behave, and that's and there's a lot to carry in terms of mental overhead that you don't necessarily know in advance, even though you're writing it. Um, that you need to commit to thinking through and commit to creating processes and and right and frameworks for understanding what's happening. And then the end result is something that's valuable to consumers. Right? The interesting thing about what you do is you also have the daunting task, and maybe daunting is not the right word, but she's not going to listen to this, so I don't care. <laughs> you also have the daunting task of relaying this to not only a human being, but to one Steffi Cohen, which is near, she's near and dear to our heart. But <laughs> That can be like when I talk stuff. So Steph went to PT school, yeah. physical therapy school. So she in like a similar domain of professional expertise as us. When I talk about the mechanics and stuff with her, and she's like, "Blah blah 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 blah," you're boring me. Stop <laughs> boring me. It's like I don't know how we're friends. Yeah. How is it? Because like, how is it that the meritocracy of software engineering has it helped you communicate with people? Yes, because the way you think through any problem is enhanced when you think through it in terms of um, designing an interface that a computer needs to understand, right? The computer doesn't make assumptions. It doesn't do magic, right? If you define a problem and a solution that can be solved with a program, you basically are talking to a right, an inert machine, right? right? There's, no, there's nothing lost in translation because there can't be. It only does what it, what it tells you to do. And if it does something wrong, it's because you didn't understand, you know, you didn't expect the right things from the, from the machine, and you create all these other um, tools around it to so you know what to expect when the program runs. Um, when you have a business problem, um, I talked about this on another podcast, Kyle Trainer's podcast, is that business problems sh- often are engineering problems first. Really? Yeah. So they're not people problems. Um, they are people problems because they're just you're just designing something that talks to people rather than machines. And programs also talk to people, right? Programs are written for people and run by machines, right? If they weren't written for people, they would look very different, right? They're readable human syntax, 
right? So other people need to understand what your program is doing, just like other people need to understand what your business is doing and what your product is selling and what your, what your press releases are saying, right? So code is also written so that they're clear and human readable. And if it's not, it can still work, but you've, right, but you've accumulated the debt of figuring out what it's gonna, what, what it's gonna do later. Essentially, you've, there's, um, I've heard it explained, you're, you're now unkind to your coworkers or you're unkind to your future self. Um, because you're no longer being clear. Explain about, that. What do you mean so by like, that? Right, when you come, right, so when you write something that works now, but you don't, but it's not clear to a person reading it what it's doing, someone else in the future will have to figure out what it's doing. Right? Right, okay. And that, might, that person might be you because you will have forgotten why it works because because the only way you know now that it works is because you're kind of remembering kind of these, these, these you know, the magic that's happening. Right. Um, that's not clear. Um, so I'm reading this book, um, Software Engineering at Google. It's like lessons learned from programming over time. The idea that engineering is programming when you add time and people. Right, programming is just programming a computer. Engineering is building for, for people and scale. Right. Um, the idea, and so clever is like a compliment in programming. It's an insult in, in engineering. That clarity over cleverness is 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 the idea. Holy shit, that's not to unpack there, man. What? It's so well, good, I think that's yeah. I, I like so okay. Good. So and that one more time. People, one, one, right? one more time. One more time. Clarity, <laughs> cleverness. Go. Yeah. Go with that. What was that? So clever, cle- like clever is neat little hacks. It's like the the quickest possible way. It's, right. It's you know. These sleek one-liners, yeah, it's the sly right? fox, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's something neat, right? Something that nobody understands, right? Um, that's the same way you, right? That's the same problem that could happen when you talk to people in a business context, right? right? Or you, when you sell products to consumers, or when you're trying to just solve any business problem, is like you can come up with a clever, a clever solution that doesn't scale across people in time, right? Right. So engineering and programming, you run into scale very quickly because you're not limited by anything anymore other than right compute and storage which is virtually limitless right 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 so you're build and but but then you end up then you end up running into human problems like how, you know can you manage this thing how do you understand it how do you add features how do you clean it up how do you right how do you it's like ui re- ux stuff yeah but or uh, it's at every level it's not just you know ui ux it's like at some point you know right at some point infrastructure does get expensive at some point you know Compile times get slow. Some, at some point, like like the code base gets bigger and it's harder to test. Like you know, so more but like the more code you write, the more bugs you potentially write, right? And so does engineering time scale with this? You know, or the like the cost of engineering scale linearly with the size of the code base because that's unsustainable, right? So how do you how do you manage economies of scale um, when the business of your business is writing code that does things for consumers? Because um, that still is our business. Um, right, it's it's code that allows people to log and distribute workouts. How often yeah. do you have to recheck <laughs> and calibrate to that goal? Like, is it difficult? Because I would imagine, I don't know, man. I, I've known you for a handful of years now, and like going through your demystification, boiling frog phase of like the chiropractic <laughs> profession, and like maybe I was there a few times to turn the heat up a little <laughs> bit on that. I'm like, hey, man, whatever this laptop is, and you know, I didn't have to explain that to you, but it was a matter of like. Is it difficult now? Because I feel like you learn computer science one problem at a time. Yeah. Right? Where it's like you so started to see hybrid as like the CEO as a software a software problem. Yeah. Right? Like, and that needed a bunch of solutions. And in knowing some just of the peripheral, archaic, monolithic, previous hybrid site, and now looking at the new one, mm. what a breath of fresh air you've been. Mm. But it's like, how do you... How do you? How would you recommend systematizing this way of learning, other than the way you've learned it? Because you seem like here's you walking into an enterprise mm-hmm. that has an issue, and you've sort of just tripped over, not tripped over information, but like you've learned this one problem at a time. Yeah, you know, the problem was kind of given to me. Yeah, which was nice. I don't know. I think I feel like I feel fortunate for that, and I don't know if my way is the best way. Or but how do you way. know where you're? Do you know enough now where you like your boundaries of your knowledge are? Like I feel yeah. like if I went down yeah, a problem I'm, set, I'm not ignorant of I. I think I've expanded the borders of my ignorance in that world to the point where I know I'm ignorant of some things that I need to learn at some point in the future, right? Or or need to know enough about to 
to to know when somebody else you know is a specialist right because the problem with with software engineering is if you don't know anything you can't manage anybody who does it right because right. you don't understand the constraints of their problems and they can bs you or they or you just don't know when to you know when to when or how to make decisions right, right? you don't know what a good you don't know what good work looks like yes because it's just so foreign or right. it's literally different language. that's like you talking to yeah. Steph. Me and Steph were talking conversation last night, and she's like, I have four responses when Ian talks to me. Oh, yeah, that's wild. No way. Really sounds good. And it's like, when I talk to you about this kind of stuff, I literally, I don't know if you can see, it's like I'm, tr it's like I'm strapped to the back of a flatbed truck, and I'm just like trying to hold on. And the words are just like flying by me, and I think I know enough to be like, okay, I think he's talking about this. And I say yeah. something like, oh, and then this happens? And they're like, yeah, exactly. I'm like, <sighs> Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not the hardest thing in the world to understand. It's like, and I think it's just about kind of, right, it's, you know, to make the, the laborious training analogy, it's time under tension. It's just time with the concepts because hmm. they're just different mental models. They're often relatively simple. It's just thinking through kind of these abstractions and getting familiar with them because it is very abstract and out there like you're thinking about, you know, you know these kind of, these these kind of processes and these kind of steps and all 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 the stuff and you think and you're thinking about things that contain other things and right it's just but they're just things that you're thinking about they're not they're not you know you can't like physically wrap your head around them unless like you have like this trial by error process of like having a computer in front of you and then like trying to write some code and seeing what it does and then seeing and then printing it out and then seeing that it doesn't do what you think it does and then writing some more code. And then, so you actually get to like kind of write, you get to, to feel it and work with it. And it's the same thing for like, that's almost in every area of kind of um, software engineering or kind of whatever technical side of the business you're looking at. It's like if you're talking about like like operations and infrastructure, like you can go into the Amazon Web Services console and try to deploy a server and see how hard that is, and then see where where you kind of run into errors and issues, and that's how you that's how you learn. You don't just like learn the the kind of the ABCs and then one day it comes together, right? The weird thing to me is a lot of what you do is on like, and we we're kind of talking about this before we started, like the predictive side, mm -hmm. like of of using technology to predict behavior of like yeah. what people are going to want. Yeah. Because people in aggregate are very predictable. Right. But is that disconcerting to you as a person? Because like there's a lot of talk now with like privacy and like every time I get like an Instagram, Facebook, Shopify, yeah. Pinterest, and I don't have Pinterest, but like every time I get a new wave of like you need to agree to these new terms and conditions and all the tech companies <laughs> just did it overnight, I'm like, oh crap. Yeah, I mean I because I know I know to a reasonable degree of of kind of familiarity how those models work and they're very simple they're they're doing some machine learning which is which is a which is a very simple it's a simple algorithm it's just it's just a lot of computation it's just taking your history of of, of purchases or actions and some kind of uh content information about you like whether it's your location or some other attribute they know about you usually that you volunteered like they're not stealing it and then all they do is they have some supervised target variable, like did you purchase something or not, or did you rate something or not? And then they basically try to fit a approximate a function, a very complicated function that will predict future events based on similar. So what is your basis. stance around like current privacy laws and the way like people are practicing like Facebook? Like do you think well like Facebook is acting in good faith? Um no, because the models are 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 not. The hard part is is the models are optimized only for for a specific loss function, which is minim, which is minimizing right minimizing a loss function. So that's the optimization strategy. What does that mean? So minimizing a loss function means they're trying to predict some some target, which is usually clicking on something or buying something, and they want to present some sort of um, event that maximizes the likelihood that you predict on something based on some sort of prior knowledge about you, which is often history, right? Your history on the site. Right. Right. But is that which in is itself the most facetious? No, because it's not it's not hidden from you. Like the data itself is hidden from everybody because it's it's um 
it's uninterpretable, right? It's like you're taking, right? The models have millions of parameters, right? right? You're not going to say, well, this is predicting this and this is predicting that. We're getting better at visualizing those representations that these models create. Um, right? That goes, that we've talked about before, that goes with neural network architectures. So, like, there's some, like, there's just some math you have to get through to like get an intuition about it, but there is a way to get intuitions about how those models work. But right on the whole, like ethical, not ethical. Um, they you can basically inject ethics into those models. They just are. That's a new thing. Okay, so like I mean, what <laughs> right, I'm right, you can, right, you can you can establish constraints in terms of eth like you, you can, yeah. But are they? Well, arguably Facebook isn't, and arguably the entire make the argument. The entire, I mean, the entire ad-driven business model is is a perverse incentive. So that might be the fundamental problem. Is that the? Ad- I feel <laughs> like we had, and I, th- I think I got this from Gallery, yeah. but like we have two forms of government now, mm-hmm. like social media platforms. And I, when mm-hmm. I heard that, I was like, that's fucking brilliant, mm-hmm. right? Like that we and we vote with our attention, right? So like Facebook, yeah, it, with like Facebook and Instagram, the amount of people who are getting censored now on Instagram, and like overtly censored like yeah. we are not this is against our t's and c's yeah so so right humans still set what are called hyperparameters because the parameters are weights and biases right are just like whatever you think why you know y equals ax plus b like a and b are the parameters right but but we decide what the models right what the loss function is so what that means is like we decide that um that we that we have an ad-driven business model and we, and we want clicks and we want to create a model that maximizes clicks, right? If we if we want nothing else, then that's what we'll get, right? The models are very are not smarter than that, but they're just very good because they have a lot of data, and they have good algorithms. Which the, the algorithms all they're doing is 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 seeing you know results, estimating the loss, and then changing the the many 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 weights. To then try to minimize loss in the future, right. and they get to a point where the loss is actually very low, and that that in theory and in practice then transfers to unseen data, right? So you train on existing data where you know the answer, and then you get new data where you don't, and you make predictions, and that's how you do inference with machine learning models. And these are just recommendation systems; so they're actually relatively simple. Computer vision is much hard, is much more complicated because every pixel is now a data point, and um, and audio is essentially vision; it just makes the audio spectrogram is a, is a picture, right? Text is really hard, and text generation is like the is like the new frontier, and that's getting way better. Uh, more of a frontier than 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 visual and picture and using. Yeah, like, we've solved computer vision. Like, computers see better than people, you know. And that was the convolution stuff we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, that's right? Uh huh. And so this is an interesting kind of related to the healthcare field. Um, what's it called? Uh, so um, DeepMind is is one of those kind of experimental AI companies. Um, they they built the the reinforcement learning model that um, beat Go or, or right. that solved Go. Yeah. Um, and then they solved StarCraft, which is an even crazier problem and didn't get as much press. I'm unfamiliar with the like, challenges of solving StarCraft. But it beat, sounds like they, a monumental task. They just beat the best players in the world at StarCraft, which is a much more open. It's open. It's even more open than Go. And then you have these other weird limitations about the model has to click. You know. Uh, you know, has is, to do mouse clicks. But the newest thing that they solved was the protein folding problem, which is that they can predict the three D structure of proteins from kind of these two dimensional residues of the distances between the amino acids, and this, that the, the 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 space of potential problem, you know, the, the space of potential solutions is so much bigger than any other problem before. That was like considered an unsolvable problem, and what it does allow you to do is you know do drug discovery and and understand diseases better based on Knowing the because it ta- it's like enormously expensive to use like crystallography to get the 3D structure of protein, but now you just look at a at this kind of stain and you and you get a really good estimate. But these models, so that's essentially a vision problem, which is interesting. But they used basically these new text generation models, which are enormous and much more complicated. They're called transformers, and they did better than the older convolution models on the same problem. So a text-based model did better than a visual-based well, model. A model well, the 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 architectures aren't really kind of fixed on a, on a problem domain they've just been like people develop an architecture they realize it, it does well on a on a problem domain usually the architectures develop independently of the problem right domain. it's similar to like yeah. a drug where yeah. it's like oh like here's sidenafil citrate yeah. it's meant for heart disease now you have a boner now yeah. we have viagra yeah, yeah. Com- convents have their own weird history and then they're, they're kind of like discovered as to doing well on vision they're like oh we have no idea why this does well with vision, but we'll keep doing it. Right. And then run convents on text problems too where you like slide it, that, that's a whole conversation i don't want to get to but um the, but they have these huge models because text is really hard because context 
sure. is like this is has, is this moving average that but it, but it's not a real moving average. Like context can be carried very far across distances of text. So something you say very early in a text body can have relevance for something you say very late. But in what text if I body. said the word cunt? Well, right. that, well, well, the internet is full of profanity and and. and what if I said it in things. Australia? It's like terms of endearment. I could be writing a letter to my mother. Yeah, so I mean, the hard part of text generation is filtering out obscene content, and and, sure. and, if, and if the model is generating text that can generate obscene content. Yes. Um. So a lot of the ones in productions have have filters over over the results because they will produce obscene content. Wasn't that similar to like when they tried to run AI models to teach it the English language and they used Twitter as like the source and then and all of a sudden it was, was anti-Semitic? Yeah, it was like, a racist oh. webinar. <laughs> but I mean, when you get those models, you're training it on just, on just data scraped from the internet because um, you just need massive amounts of text. But, um, so, but, but anyway, these text-based models are these models that have been traditionally applied to text, and traditionally, I mean, by in the past two years, right? right. That, that's how old. Classics. Are. You know, <laughs> they're, old, they're old news now. When they're being applied to these very, very high dimensional problems, and they're performing really well, um, and because and they're kind of generate, and that means they can also generate novel kind of um, representations. So the right, they're, the output is like a new thing, right? So you can take a, a structure or something, and then you're not getting like a, a yes or no, like will buy or won't buy. That's actually a very simple problem. You're getting this very intricate either body of text. A new image, uh, right, or a three D structure of a protein, right? How does that apply to what we do on the internet? Um, so are you going to tell me that like we're going to start seeing hybrid apparel well, indicated by shirt color and design based well, off you, of preferences? Well, you already see chatbots; those are easy, right? And you sure. see and you see sequences, but like you see text suggestions rather than text but that's classes. old news. Yeah, that's because that's good, but it, but it takes a while for it to get an industry, right? Right. It needs to be pretty good and experimental um, research. And pretty well understood for it to end up in industry because you, it needs to be reliable and deployable, and also needs to have. Imagine your help support chatbot got all of a sudden anti-Semitic. That'd yeah. be a huge problem. Yeah. yeah, and just it needs to have business value, right? It needs to it, the, the benefits need to be better. You know, you know more. Um, right, you need to have more benefit than cost associated with that. I mean, there's some just like people being fashionable, and like we want, you know, we want transformer models in our, you know. In our text generation, and not the old, um, well, whatever uh, they were called. Um, anyway, they, they, there was a there was a bunch of other architectures that were that were popular until a couple of years ago. But the idea is that there's a whole world of that. Um, I don't know how we got there, but yeah, this, the idea is that the data is the data is is only recently. Um, has only recently kind of yielded these very um, valuable predictive insights, and companies with a lot of data can get better, right? Insights from them, and they can get and they can build products based off of the off of that data. Where do you stand with your own personal ethics around your data? Understanding that a large part of what you do is extrapolating and interpreting data from others. Mm -hmm. Like, are you, because we had this conversation the other day. Hayden and I got lost because he used fucking Apple Maps because mm -hmm. he's some weird uppity guy. He's like, dude, what are you, what are you hiding? Like, you don't want, to, want him to know that we're going to the bathhouse? Like, fuck, <laughs> can we use Google and get there on time? Like, we're in Hialeah. I feel like I'm going to get shot. <laughs> so, like, where is it that you stand? Because, like, I, I mean, I think, like, because we've talked about, like, the net, like, neural convolution networks and stuff like that in the past. I think now with, like, the landscape around technology and going to the past election and then Russian spy bots built into like base level code of yeah. things that are getting downloaded like I think it's more of a like an ethical conversation around data collection and and social yeah. media because like I think it's such a big part of our industry right like yeah. wh where do you stand personally on um, well, well, well I mean with Facebook and Instagram we're customers of Instagram we, we, we right it's more that's an ethical thing because we buy ads not because we're like participating in their in their machine learning ecosystem Right, right. We're funding it, and also, I mean, also, we use their, we also use their machine learning like open source tools, and open source is a whole other thing because that's also the culture of software that we're that we're in, and that might be a source of security issues. But there's also no alternative to that. There's no, there's no going back to the old way of doing things. Um, right, software is shared and free, and anyone can contribute to it. And, and but it's, your it's, personal it's, stance, oh, okay. So my personal stance on it is for us. I don't think 
as long as you're transparent about what you're doing, um, and also there's reasonable ethical limitations to what you're collecting, and you're not, and you understand the 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 incentives that you're driving. So like, right, we could make hy the hybrid app as addictive as possible, right. just with like balloons and <laughs> you know, and it's actually and just it's just bejeweled. Yeah, it's just it's not <laughs> trading at all. And, ex and XP points and try to like create in in app purchases and whatever. But it's like we don't do that. And also because that also there's also a this is something that learning apps have struggled with is you don't want to incentivize people to part, to engage as much as possible as early as possible because you can because you might burn them out right right so you are a monthly recurring revenue yeah, model yeah so there's so there's actually you a line keep them on the needle yeah there's a well there's a line incentives there is like you want people to train for many months so you want them to space out their training so they don't you know become unable yeah, to train yeah, for yeah, many yeah. months. Yeah, yeah, and then they quit yeah. for whatever reason, whether it's your fault or not. So the idea is how do we incentivize long-term engagement? And that's kind of, there's a, there's a gamification in that sense, but there's kind of I, I, a good model for understanding as white hat versus black hat gamification. Right. Right, and then so there's a, there are... Explain that for people who okay. don't know the difference between like what a black hat is versus a white hat. So a black hat has like some insidious motive, right? Yeah. It has some short-term incentive. The ethics, hackers ethics, is ethics, like kind of yeah. the classic. Term. Yeah, they, they're motivated to... You know, to get some reward at the expense of the of the, of the other party, right? It's ultimately harmful to the other party. Right. Um, the white hat is kind of mutually beneficial. Right. So, right? like white versus black hat gamification. Black hat, like black hat conventions, are basically like, hey, companies will come in and be like, can you see if you can hack what we have? And then people with insidious motivations will be like, all right, let's see if I can get in and behind your firewall, which is probably the most simple fucking '90s term of all time. Yeah, white hat hack, white hat hackers. Hack for the benefit of the company to right. expose, you know, security holes. Right. Yeah. Black so hat. the gamification within the in-app purchase, but like you personally as a consumer, like if I turned on Instagram right now, one of the first things Instagram does when I turn it on, yeah, is it turns the little mic feature off. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. When you open Instagram, the mic feature in the top left is like, oh shit! Oh, it's like <laughs> I was like the other night. Hade was so, talking. So my thing is they, I'm pretty sure they. They're not good enough to collect ambient noise. The recommendations are just that good, and they're collecting, you know, pixel information from pretty much any device that they know is associated with your account. Okay, so here's right? the thing: situation. <laughs> we were driving back from Tampa the other day. Yeah. Hayden's a watch guy, big yeah. watch guy, big big watch guy. Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck, right? I check my phone for the time. Hayden's trying to convince me, like, hey man, like you know, maybe a Speedmaster, mm -hmm. maybe a Submariner. Let's mm -hmm. get you started on this, like, dude. Maybe a Coke addiction. Why the fuck are we gonna spend this much money on a watch? Yeah. <laughs> the next morning, I woke up to my first scroll of Instagram ads, like as I passed through, was Omega Speedmaster. Where does your ethical boundary lie and the fact that this fucking glass rectangle was in my pocket case in my conversation and then it was selling me a nine thousand dollar watch the next morning where does ian kaplan not ian kaplan coo of a yeah. tech company ian kaplan the guy who picks up his phone and goes wait a minute yeah speedmaster yeah i mean i, I don't i'm not a i'm not a fan of the edge of a business model but you're still on the platform. What would be a breaking point for you? I'm not. I mean, I'm not that intensely on the platform. Right. Hybrid's on the platform, right? But you, are, you are so far up hybrid's ass. If you spit, it's coming out of its mouth. Yeah. Right. Like, where does your yeah, ethical I mean, standards lie with that? I mean, like, like for example, for me, like, I want to, I want to move our Facebook group off Facebook. I don't think that's a good place to have a group. Do you feel you like know? Facebook is volatile? Right now, not like yeah. volatile in the sense of its actual. Like, I mean, at a certain point, it was what three percent of the U.S. economy. I don't know. What, Do you remember that statistic? Like, it, like it's gross like, revenue like, or something oh, like oh, that like, was three percent of. I mean, I mean, it's pretty close. Do you feel like you could wake up one day and there be an order passed down that Facebook has some has violated some antitrust law and has had undergone some sort of legal action where it can no longer exist? I don't think it would. That's. I think that's unreasonable to expect that. I think that's a. Do you that's feel a like very Facebook, unlikely? I think it's much more like right. It's much more likely that they're forced to. To spin off Instagram or something. Okay, so do you um, feel like Facebook's on its way out? Um, I well, I feel like yeah, the Facebook platform is less well, and less viable. What's next? Um, I don't know if one thing replaces it. Right, I don't know if there's a Facebook equivalent of Facebook. So yeah. like, will that spell the end of the line for centralized social networking? Like, and when I say that, it's like Friendster gave rise to MySpace. MySpace gave rise mm. to. 
Facebook. Yeah, I don't know if there's one social network. I think people would go to diff- they're, they're, people are familiar with social network sites, so they could have multiple in their head. So here's like maybe an right? example. So like let's say Facebook was like CrossFit. Yeah. Where it's like CrossFit comes with it many sub disciplines and subdomains, gymnastics, powerlifting, weightlifting, yeah. um, strongman, and so on. Facebook was kind of like that, where mm-hmm. it was like pictures, it was statuses, mm-hmm. it was chats, it was groups. And it's and like, it's well, so many things, and it doesn't do ma- any of them well. Right. And now <laughs> all of a sudden, all we have, you know, like Discord, where we were talking about Discord the other day for yeah. like chat function and group function, that might be better. Yeah. Instagram has taken the picture. Twitter yeah. has sort of been able to, with politics, kind yeah. of come back and, and take over like the status. Yeah. Do you feel like there's just going to be like a, a cotta equina of like, okay, now we're going to break off in a bunch of different directions. And yeah. now social media platforms will be much more. Uh, do, you, do you feel like that's a problem though? Like the, the nice part about Facebook was that you got, not only like were you exposed to like different media, like different types of media, but also like different opinions. Well, like, it, it's a problem because data is, d- data is importable on Facebook, right? What do you mean? Like Facebook is a closed ad auction where you can't access any of the data, you can't move it. Right, there's some weak integration where you're like, oh, import your Facebook profile, and then you get spun up on this ad. But really, but now people really don't do that. They do it with Twitter and in Google, right. right? With their their single sign-on or their kind of OAuth credentials. Um, Google's much better with that. But the idea is, Facebook consolidated these features that existed on other platforms to try to make Facebook the one central location where people spent time on the internet, so that they could be sold ads. Right. Right. Um, and so, right, and so Facebook managed the entire ad auction, which used to happen on basically every site, right, right. With, with banner ads and stuff like that. Um, that. That makes sense for consumers in that it gets, you get the free product and you get the convenience of only logging into one page and Facebook.com is your internet, which it is in many parts of the world. But eventually the, your product is worse, right? It's a worse experience. Um, and the advantage of, of of having one place to go also means that you can't you can't move very easily when a better place comes up. Right. But eventually, the other places are so good that you just give up on Facebook and you move to those other places. And that and that kind of ecosystem of other places will have data portability, so that you can right, so that you can whether there's a product that consolidates all of those other does uh, that products. Does, does that have a net positive on at both like the like the consumer and creator level? Because like I think yeah. of like LinkedIn, right? I have some friends who, who do really well in marketing yeah. on LinkedIn because it's like... LinkedIn not, is also a good business with a good good ad model. and But you know. it converts. You're yeah. paying, but you're getting like your... Like if you're selling a higher ticket item, your, mm. your, your margin on your acquisition is actually still pretty good because you're just... There are people who are engaged in the platform and it's almost like people... Subdivide in their plat <laughs> their platform based off of their personality, mm-hmm. right? Like someone who's more Twitter focused, probably like the the archetypal Twitter user is probably much different than the stereotypical Instagram user, different than the Pinterest user. Yeah, there's community, there's sub communities, right? Right. It's like for example, like tech focused people are almost entirely on Twitter, right? Yeah, but like even down to like not even just just overarching domains of interest, yeah. but like personality types. Like pieces of shit go on YouTube <laughs> and leave comments. Oh, like right. there's a special, like there's a special type of human. Like YouTube as a as a media consumption, is, as a medium in which to consume media is very strange to me. Yeah. Like people who like, because we know YouTubers. Mm-hmm. You know how strange that is. Have yeah. you ever like like oh what did so and so do? Ah oh, yeah he's a fitness YouTuber and you carry on without your day. I said that the other day and I was just like he's a what? Yeah. What does that mean? And then, like, there are people who go he on gets, and leave. He, he gets people to watch ads for a living, right? Yeah, yeah that's what he does. <laughs> and, but there's people who comment negatively on that, uh-huh. right? So, like, there's a personality type. Shit, I've seen people leave negative comments on porn videos. It's like, <laughs> what type of special human being are you? But there seems to be like underwriting. Obviously, like domains of competence are going to be you know Twitter, po- Twitter maybe has technology and politics, journalism, mm. those subdomains, yeah. but. Those come with it, personality types and sub traits, and like if I'm selling a Montblanc pen, because based on the design of the platform, right? It's who it, a certain kind of person interacts with it more efficiently, right? Right, and and it has features that they find valuable, 
But you, as someone who operates a business, do you that subdivision must be incredibly valuable? And does that help guide well, some of your decision making process? Well, but, but like for us, we 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 think fitness is Instagram, right? Right. Is but do you <laughs> you project that to always be the case? No. Where is it going? I, I don't know. Do you not know? And you're just not giving it up? I, I'm armed. I don't know at all. I think I think we're still fit in fitness Instagram world. Okay. Yeah, I feel like it would be <laughs> tough to break the visual presentation yeah. of Instagram. You need a better visual app. Right. Right. Which in, Twitter's not going to give no. you. YouTube's yeah. too yeah. too laborious. Yeah, I don't think one exists. Now, what is your take on the Spotify push to take over um, and, podcasting? It's a good business move. I mean, Spotify in general is a good business. Um, uh, just the idea that it's probably it's not a core business; it's a peripheral business. But the idea that they are, they have this infrastructure set up so that they are in the audio business and not just the music business, right? And that they want to own people's listen time, right? And they want to be the app, the default app, even though Apple Music or Apple, I think it's called Apple Music, right? The the, the built-in Apple app yeah. is already on their phone. They need to overcome that barrier, which they have because they have a better product, right? Apple Apple Music is terrible. Um, but, um, right. Again, also, but also Spotify's business is based on, you know, um, it's a marketplace of artists and listeners. It's also great recommendations and, and, a, and a beautiful dashboard and reliable kind of service delivery and great engineering. And one of the kind of the cost of may of maybe premium podcasts might be too high for some people, but, the the idea that podcasts are exclusively in one place was probably only a matter of time, really, because it because it professionalizes those high level podcasts, which were just kind of free marketing arms of of other businesses. So you see things like Luminary and all that just being just having to bend to the will of Spotify. I mean, maybe, but I don't know what kind of kind of second or third tier kind of market share they could carve out of Spotify's right. kind of dominant. In a similar position. fashion where with music like Tidal or whatever mm. has tried to like get into Spotify. Like that's like Jay Z's thing. Yeah. Now what platforms are you watching coming up? We we but, briefly sorry. But that was another thing is like um so I think Jeff Bezos says like you see margin, I see opportunity. I was like Okay, fuck you, know, you trillionaire. Well, you see margin. You see trillions of dollars. But the idea is, right, Prime is, is very low, a low margin business. Um, Amazon Web Services is a high margin business, but it's lower margin than the than on-premises data centers, um, which is both, which are the two fastest, whatever fastest businesses to $10 billion in revenue ever. Like, like Amazon Web Services was the first and Amazon Retail was the second. Retail happened first. How um, quickly did they make it to... It was like less than like two years. Nah. <laughs> it was like the growth rate is, is zero to ten billion in two years is like is it, it's an infinite growth rate. Uh, but <laughs> but um, the just the idea that the music industry was carving out these massive margins and then just trying to police copyright yeah. um, was insane. And then Spotify was like, we can do this legally and still not charge people for all of the world's music. So yeah. it's like James Hatfield from Metallica <laughs> yeah, yeah. doesn't have to take you to court and yeah. end up in prison. Yeah. Or we fight the one or two legal battles to make this legal because we think it's legal. We'll, we'll still pay record labels. We'll still pay artists. But but people get access to the to all the world's music and we'll subsidize it with, with low-cost subscriptions. right? If, if us only if, if whatever, less than 10% of people subscribe, and I think it's like 2% or something. I could be wrong, though. But like it's reasonable to expect that like 1% of people actually subscribe to Spotify and don't get the ads and everything. That's enough to to fund a sixty billion dollar business, right? Yeah. And that's the only <laughs> platform I pay for. Yeah, I pay for it. Yeah. yeah, I think it is. It is. It was like a nine dollar value is an insane value. Yeah, I remember <laughs> traveling a lot, and the way I would listen to music in the gym was I would have to just stream on YouTube, and I would, dude, I was paying one single text message that pop up like you've reached your half gig data limit for the day because you're in fucking Beirut and you're trying to listen to Limp Biscuit while you train. It's like, well, this is an easy thing. I'll just pay yeah. nine bucks and I can stream it forever. Yeah. So I guess the right that's a good example of right. You have this people problem of people find music too expensive, or people want to find music they like. They want music to be discoverable. The second problem is how do you do that? And the the the, the, the first one is probably an obvious solution. The, the the first problem is obvious. The second problem is not obvious, right? Which is how do you make it real? Right. Like how do you write it? Like how do you build existence? it? How do you build it? Right. 
how do you manage that? When right? you navigate that app, are you thinking about like the source code of it? Are you thinking about yeah. the like how does this actually work? Yes. But, uh, does that frustrate the fuck out of you? No, because a lot of those companies they tell you exactly how it works. There's a blog, there's a website called engineering at Spotify.com or whatever, and they tell you all the things they're working on because that's how they that's how they kind of compete for engineering talent. One, they want people to be familiar with how they work, and two, they want to show all the cool things that they're doing because um, that's how you get like top level talent. But yeah, but not like the very little details because there's a lot, right? Like every right, Spotify is a classic like. Um, kind of matrix structure where these like there's these pods or squads or whatever you want to call them that are kind of cross functional that are all working on like features or like components. So like and then there's some sort of functional kind of structure where like all the designers have a design kind of lead, but they're all de they're all kind of embedded in different units. Right. So it's like you just think of it in terms of components. It's like who's well who's designing the you know kind of my profile or who's designing you know the little recommended for you section, right? Yeah. Who's who's doing and then there's like an infrastructure team that supports that, right? And they have a really cool kind of there's multiple components to that there's like right, there's there's data scientists who are doing kind of the predictive stuff. There's, you know, true kind of um, infrastructure teams or, or ops people that are building the systems that actually deploy right uh, the application and production. And they have their own kind of internal solution for that. There are many back end services. They use a microservice architecture. So it's like they have people who do API design, right? Um, we've actually built some of the, they've kind of migrated to a system that we were using on some services um, from their own kind of bespoke solution. But yeah, so like learning how they, the pieces fit together, what the architecture is like, I think is really important to, to know kind of the solutions that are out there when you're presented with a problem, even if your problem isn't at the same scale, because. Again, scale runs away from you very quickly, right? And, so, know. in your opinion, like what apps right now? Like Spotify is one who seems to have done it very well. Mm -hmm. Like identifying maybe like the top five. Like I don't know if Spotify would count as a social media platform, but let's group it in there. Clubhouse. Um, Clubhouse is brand new. So I don't know. Clubhouse, Discord, um, whatever the fuck. Uh, what was the one that was supposed to be like super right wing? Parlor, parlor. Yeah. What happened that dude? That that died on the table. What yeah. happened there? That, I thought well, that was like that was the one where I was thinking well, no, like no cloud, no um, cloud provider would host them because of because of political reasons. They were like part of Breitbart News or something like or that. They said some weird things, and then Amazon Web Services were like, "No, we want to we want to do business with you." And then and then they tried to go to every other cloud provider, and they're like, "We're not touching you." So here's you the know? weird part about that. The other day, I was in like Pensacola. Yeah. Northern Florida gets real weird <laughs> real quick. Like Miami yeah. is just diverse. There's yeah. Cubans. No yeah. one speaks English. There's yeah. Russian gangsters, million-dollar fucking yachts with helicopter pads. And then you you go up to 95, about an hour and a half. You get like Naples. And you're like, oh, Dorothy, where the <laughs> fuck am I? And I was in a parking lot, and I was, we stopped at Chick-fil-A, mm -hmm. and then we went to a gas station that was next to a Jimmy John's. Yeah. And I was like, here's something... That's really interesting because if these companies existed solely on the internet, they would not exist. These are two companies that, to my knowledge, and like they don't really, I don't know if they have Chick-fil-A or Jimmy John's in Canada. Mm -hmm. I know enough about Jimmy John's to know that the owner of Jimmy John's said some not cool things about homosexual people. Yeah. And the chicken people seem to be right up the God tree yeah. and they are closed on Sundays and they don't really like gay people either. Yeah, but people love Chick Fil A. <laughs> so I've literally heard it on seven different occasions by seven different people. Literally coined, Chick Fil A is the God's chicken. Yeah, people are like people love their Chick Fil A. But it doesn't matter. But like that's say. crazy to me that here you have <laughs> online, right? And this kind of speaks to the personality subtypes that end up finding. You know, what is the what is the personality of someone who's going to head up a, a, a made to deliver pizza company mm. versus who, what's the type of Personality of someone that's going to head up uh, Twitter, it, but it's also more about shareholder tolerance. It's like I don't know, if, I don't, I don't think Chick Fil A is publicly traded, and I'm pretty sure Jimmy John's isn't either. But it's it's yeah. publicly traded in the sense that if enough yeah, people like, didn't like yeah. the fact that you spoke out about homosexual, they wouldn't go there. Yeah. They wouldn't go there. So it is publicly traded. Well, yeah, the public gives them money. Yeah, well, the, well, people still like their chicken. But that isn't that a problem? But yeah, so but the idea with AWS feels pressure to. To cancel business with a small company, one because it doesn't influence their business at all. Right. Two, they're they don't they're afraid of the political pressure 
because they're they are a big lobbyer, and two, if their shareholders get upset, that influences their their stock price, right? So that those are the the economic drivers of those decisions, and right. they're not they're not that someone at Amazon is like I'm outraged that some crime, that some you know some whatever some uh, something I find morally repugnant happened with some customer on my platform because crimes happen on their platform. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> right? true. Right. They're the pipe. Let's imagine it's like the road builder saying they're you know they're upset that you know someone killed someone on their road. You know? Right. But. <laughs> If you have the ability yeah. to stop people going on your road, yeah. If you know, right? right? If you know there's a criminal on your road, you can say, "Don't go on my road." Yeah, but that's know? the censorship <laughs> issue, right? Yeah, like, yeah. there's fucking there's but there like are, child porn rings on Facebook, yeah. But people are getting censored for like talking about COVID news. Yeah, I mean, it's just a question of, but that's what Section Two Thirty allows them to to censor whatever they want and not censor it, whatever they want. But that is that's that's dangerous, no? It's all, but it's it's good in that the in that the the road builder is not legally liable for the crime that happens. But on the so road. here's <laughs> the biggest fucking problem, though. If the road builder is also the gatekeeper, right? Like you've seen the Big Short. Yeah. Um, when he goes into the um, when he goes into that one office and the, the old lady. Yeah, that's... Right, but Facebook might be a gatekeeper, but AWS is not. There's a bunch of other clouds. Sure, right. but I mean, more and more like cloud <laughs> yeah. services are yeah. kind of like yeah. this meta, yeah. this meta service that yeah. like the world just runs on. Yeah. But like Facebook, you can't throw your hands in the air and just be like, "Well, we're just a platform," and it's like, "No, you're not." It's like Russell Brand did a podcast once, and he was making a joke about um, I, th- I forget who it was with, but the person was saying something about like old folks, mm. and he's like, "Oh, there's a rule, there's like an axiom in old folks' homes that you should never do anything for someone in an old folks' home that they can't do for themselves, right? They don't <laughs> want to build dependency." Mm. And then Russell Brand just goes, "Yes, they can't have sex with their own sleeping bodies and steal their money," <laughs> like which is obviously like a terrible thing to in- in- insinuate that the staff of old folks' home is sleeping with old sleeping people or sleeping with old people who are asleep and also stealing their money because they can't do that themselves. And he just goes, I'm a comedian, I'm a comedian. Uh-huh. But it's like, I feel like Facebook does this thing where they, they when they're totally cool with being, and correct me if I'm wrong, like reaping all the benefits of being the road builder without any of the responsibilities that come with simultaneously being the gatekeeper. Yeah. Um, I mean, then, yeah, just a, it's a question of how much they actually think they're right. Monopolies tend to position themselves as not monopolies, right? So, <laughs> but they're one hundred percent are yeah, right. Yeah, like that's yeah. why they're implicated in so many like antitrust yeah, things. Yeah. Well, but like, what's your take on it? I want to know your opinion. Well, I mean, my opinion is that they. It's. I mean, it's. A, I don't want to be in that position to be able to have that problem to solve because it's a really hairy problem. The idea is they should be able to. So if they are an editorial company and they have ed- some editorial standard to to uphold, right. they can be much more restrictive about what speech is allowed on their platform and what is not allowed on their right. platform. Um, and then my sense is that you you you're a private company. You, whatever you whatever's on your platform, but you're not a public square. You're not you're not protected. There's no protective kind of open free speech environment on your platform. Just restrict the hell out of a lot of speech. Yeah, you know, restrict all political speech on your platform, make it a less attractive ad-driven business model, but a more sustainable business. I don't. I don't understand. How is that, was that? Was that an answer? Yeah. So that was like saying because you're a business, you and you're you're not in the government space. You can just you can just you know censor everybody. But then that's a the problem. They're not. Yeah. So it's like you know, you know, your but, uncle posts about Trump or some shit, which whatever. Yeah. But like, if there are people committing crimes on your road, like, why aren't your resources better spent? Well, they, they, they that's also just a resource allocation problem. It's like they need. But human, that's a big problem. They need human reviewers who speak Burmese to you know, to <laughs> to keep people from posting about a. But shouldn't that be their like fiduciary obligation? Yeah, but that was their that was their whole company ethos, which was toxic. It was just move fast and break things. It was like well, you know, scale That's, scale now and worry about the consequences later. Right, which it seems know. to be from what I've read and like I know a few people who know Zuckerberg personally and living in the valley. Yeah, it yeah. seems to be like ethics and morals are not really what's through yeah, this guy's it does, windscreen. It doesn't register with, with him or you know. he's a robot. <laughs> yeah, dude, did you remember when he was on Congress? Yeah, and he was just like sitting there, like 
just bored out of his mind, yeah, just that, telling all the old people what they wanted to hear, yeah. giving him cheat codes to Farmville or yeah, whatever the fuck. Yeah, that, that's the, I mean that's the story of his life, and that's kind of the the culture at, at Facebook. But that 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 might be the deeper issue is you know is that. But in priority. what so you like like Chick Fil A right, in the sense right, cause, where right because there is an ethics right there are there are these wonderful data, you know ethicists at Facebook and there are these great initiatives and then when the growth team comes in and says we need to hit these revenue targets yeah. they ignore everything right that the growth those team, are just window yeah, dressings yeah yeah um, so the, the question is when are you no longer a growth company and when are you a right a core piece of the internet's infrastructure. I think when you <laughs> when you broach the point where you're three percent of the world's largest economy, yeah, and when you're when you are the internet in India, yeah, yeah. like I think <laughs> I don't know, and it's weird because I'm not one for like you know government oversight. Half the reason I'm not one, I'm, half the reason I'm in Florida is yeah. I'm not a big government oversight guy. It's yeah. like oh, you're gonna give me a ticket for being outside with my friends? Yeah. Fuck you! I'm gonna yeah. go to Florida and shoot Tanner right on the side of the road. Yeah. But it's like I I just I struggle with Facebook as a platform and their ethics because of like that insidious nature of like growth first move fast break shit and mm -hmm. like it doesn't really matter what happens as a consequence like and I, I agree with hayden to a certain degree mm -hmm. of like you know apples does seem to be more morally responsible in the way they do business so another good yeah i mean apple because apple is privacy first but that's also a competitive position again for shareholders but it's right? only a competitive position because you can create yeah. Uh, like you can create this this tension between opposing forces. Yeah. Right. Like if if Facebook wasn't flying off the handle and Zuck wasn't like selling his own mother's data to get an extra buck, Apple's stance as like a responsible company wouldn't be an advantage, like an advantage position. Yeah. But there's you know there's many reasons why that strategy works for Apple because it allows them to be a, a walled garden. It allows them to not play nice with with other companies. Right. It allows them to make their own custom hardware, right? That other but wouldn't you prefer yeah. that? Like, wouldn't yeah. you prefer that yeah. being say, like, I'd much rather two companies not play nice with one another, and yeah. then at a consumer level, reap the benefit of that knife fight. Um, like, I'd much rather yeah, Apple also, stiff Samsung on some glass deal than Apple stiff me. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's costs and benefits associated with that, right? There's there's costs associated. So, I mean, the example is that, you know, there's, Chrome has a monopoly on browsers and essentially even though Safari is getting better. And basically, Google pays Apple to make Chrome a default browser, you know. Um, but the, so the idea is would browsers be better if, if they were competing more seriously? You know, but Chrome is really good. And you know, and <laughs> well, we were talking about Firefox the other yeah, day, yeah. right? Like, well, Fi Firefox kind of lost the, the the browser wars. It doesn't have the same kind of support, right? Um, but the and and Safari was terrible until until recently, and that might be some of the pressure that we're talking about. I don't know, but um, yeah. So the idea is, um, right? Sometimes those monopolies produce better low cost products for consumers because. Right, because you can hide the cost of the product somewhere and in externalities that the consumer doesn't necessarily see. Right. Right. So it's not always like, oh, that's the problem with monopolies today is they're actually good for consumers and that they create a ton of f essentially free value. Yeah. Right. You get search for free and you get, you know, social networking for free and you get, you know, you get soft, you get open source you know, mobile software for free. Right. You know. But you also <laughs> get a free ice cream if you get yeah. into the back of the guy's yeah, van. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, that's also, yeah. So, but like the idea is Apple's not free. It's expensive hardware. You know, yeah. um, and that's what you pay for. Um, and the, right, the development environment is expensive. It's expensive to make apps. It's expensive to use Xcode. It's expensive, right? There's a whole kind of, and they create a culture around it. Um, it you know, you have to learn Swift, you know, if you want to develop on Apple. Like all this, all this kind of, if you're you're either kind of in the the cult of Apple or you're not, it makes it hard. There, there's a lot of workarounds that we have to use to get into the Apple ecosystem from a company's perspective, which are kind of annoying. Um, which might be worth the cost of of the the, the really good hardware and you know, and the the nice ecosystem you know that they have internally and you know their reliability. Um, but like for example, like Whatever you have to write to whoever test your app, you have to get Mac 
instances on Amazon Web Services and test your app on Macs, <laughs> you know, because you have to make sure it runs on a Mac. Um, it's like this whole thing. But um, the so I was gonna get, like another. All right, so another app that was really good was WhatsApp. Okay. Um, but it's a it's also a good case in point of why Facebook one is a monopoly, two. Um, that would be kind of a, a, an axis on which they would be broken up is that you just don't need a, a communications platform that you're just sitting on to keep from being competitive. Right? The idea was WhatsApp was such a disruptive product in that it made expensive cell plans an absurd you know, value proposition. Right? right? It turned a $400 a month text bill into free or $1 a month. Right. And they only charged $1 a month to limit growth because this was pre-cloud and they couldn't handle the traffic. That's insane to me. <laughs> so like they so the, knew that this would blow up so much. Yeah. It's like, yo, we like need... We could charge Americans a dollar a month or a, a dollar a month, I think it was $19 a year. No, it was 99 Yeah, it was yeah. $99. Yeah. I think it was for the year. Yeah, for the year. So like about a dollar a month. We need to charge Americans that because they can afford it. We'll, make, we'll keep it free in developing countries to, for growth. Um, but this was a bunch of like Erlang developers who worked at like AT&T because they were using this kind of concurrent programming language. And like, we can build the same thing just on this new app store thing and totally circumvent the cell phone carrier by building this really scalable communication app with this kind of web socket paradigm. Um, and they did it. And then Facebook came along and was like, this is competitive. We need to buy it so it's not competitive with our They bought our two, plan. three billion? No, they bought it. So Mark Zuckerberg, so, this was, so Larry Page also, like, so Google wanted to buy it. And then they were shopping it around. I think Tencent even wanted to buy it in China. <clears throat> Um, and then Mark Zuckerberg showed up with $8 billion in cash. <laughs> in cash? In cash. What do you mean in cash? Like <laughs> in, in cash. check? N no, like... Uh, like, like showed up with a yeah, forklift? Like, he, like though he said, we're going to offer $8 billion in cash, and then the next week it was, it was in their bank accounts. Okay. So like instead of... But then they got an additional like $16 billion in Facebook stock. They got something like, something like 10 to 20% of Facebook. At for the time, WhatsApp. For WhatsApp. Wow. Which, which in today's... It, it, like in something like as of last year would have been close to a hundred billion dollars, but they liquidated their shares for ethical reasons, mostly because <laughs> they were put on the board, and then everyone who goes on the board, Facebook doesn't does stay on the board. Very yeah, long. no, no, you that's know? a firing squad. Um, but they but they came away with tens of billions of dollars, and Facebook still hasn't monetized the thing. So they're just it, made, they yeah. were just they were just stifling <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, from taking over. Yeah, but so, see, and that's the weird part, like. It, if it wasn't Facebook, it was definitely Google. Like Google has such a track record for like. Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie with? Oh fuck, what was his name? Ryan Phillippe. It's literally called Antitrust. <laughs> it's like a it's like a shitty yeah. '90s movie that basically yeah. it's like describes how every tech company yeah. gets down. But no, there's the, the a funny story about WhatsApp. Is like they were one office. They were a few dozen at most engineers. Like it's not a big. It wasn't a big organization ever. Yeah. So it was like whatever. Thirty people drove. You know. At the time, twenty five billion dollars in, in value in an acquisition is insane. Um, the there wasn't a sign on their door, and they tried because they didn't want VCs to find them and track them down and, and offer them money because they knew how much they, you know they knew what was at the end of the tunnel and they weren't taking early offers. They got a few rounds from like Sequoia, like a couple like yeah. you know they got a little bit of early founding, but they didn't need much funding, so like they just. We're trying to hide from VCs. So they knew what they, they knew <laughs> they were sitting on a gold yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had enough money. They like didn't spend like their Series B or something. They like they sat on it. So they're you know, rocking. Like, one day they rock up in a Camry, and then yeah. the next day they're rocking up in a McLaren. Yeah, it was that's some, something like that. Um, but that's just right. Again, a good a good recognition a good recognition of of an enormous amount of value on the table. Good engineers and a, and a solid crack in an engineering problem with good tools, which is at so the time. So your ethical and moral standard is basically: does the product provide more value to the consumer than it takes from them? Than it takes from them. Is yeah. that is that a yeah. fair? Is that an ethical guideline you can apply yeah. across principle? Yeah, and is that value proposition transparent? Right. Okay. Well, the transparency is an interesting one because I'm not reading those updated terms and conditions. Brexit happened, and I had to update all my T's and C's. It's like I'm not reading any of this. Yeah. Next thing you know, I can't send links. I was yeah. trying to send an Airbnb link, the Airbnb link to someone the other day through Instagram. It's like, no, you don't. Yeah. So, so maybe, like, why so can't maybe, I do that? So maybe it's the government job to make it transparent. Like right in Europe, 
you know. It should that, be written on the back of cereal boxes. Yeah. I want if I, this has to be sent out in a tweet, 140. Like, I want to be like Herman Cain. But I do not like to read. So transparency in, in Europe is the right to be deleted or the right to your own data. So like if you so like as you know, generally you can right. say, I want to go to Facebook and I want all the data you have that's associated with my account. Do you remember that yeah. that that story that kicked off with the the right to be deleted? And then the way the Boolean operator worked was that this guy was everywhere. He was like suing Google because like yeah. he had some like weird thing that he wanted to get off the internet. And then all of a sudden he was all over the internet. It's like, dude, you're just literally fighting the quicksand of the internet trying to get your name clear. Now everyone knows you're this piece of shit. Yeah, but right. That's also it's tricky legally because right, if you do business in Europe, the data has to stay in Europe, which right. is weird. Um, but you, it's doable. It's just an enormous burden to small businesses. Um, but the 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 principle is sound. It makes sense. Like you, if your data is is somewhere and and you want to know, right? Then you should have access to it. It's kind of you know with health data, it's like that, and, and that might, that has a lot of unintended consequences. Which is strange right. to me because health data could, in like the right hands, if open source, be the most valuable yeah. piece of data we have. Yeah, and it's the one thing we protect. Like Omega is trying to sell me a Speedmaster, but it's like my insurance company knows when I'm going to die. Yeah. Right, like almost down to the yeah, day, yeah. and like people don't realize how valuable that. Like, I know my rights, and it's yeah. like, dude, you want to know when you're gonna die? Because I feel like that's more important yeah. than knowing your rights. And it can, and it can be anonymized, and you can, sh- and it could be shared, and you can do research on it, it and is. you can build, you know, better, you know. Well, some of the tools. biggest platforms, not social media platforms, that I've been following coming out of the, the valley have been. Like basically, like Gluco is one that I've been watching for a couple of years, um, mm. and it's open sourcing information around people with diabetes. Yeah, right. With continuing blood glucose readers and monitors and and pens and and um, and strips and testers and all that. So yeah. it's like with big data science, you can actually just learn to manage diabetes better because you have so much data that's now open yeah. source. I mean, even applying computer vision to imaging, right? It's like you get. You get information that you don't get just by looking at it because radiologists are actually not very good. No, they're every, terrible. Every they're not really good at it, <laughs> and they have no sense of humor because they sit in a fucking black room all day. They're serial killers. Yeah, every radiologist I've ever met is just like, "Oh, you clearly sit in a in a black and white room with black and white photos all day. You're yeah. a fucking." No, the radiologist up. at Kaiser was hilarious because he's like, "This is all like he, he you know like the like chiropractor would tell them what diagnosis he wants and like he would say like whatever this person's getting X-rayed and obviously has no problems right and the radiologist knows this is a ridiculous unnecessary X-ray yeah and he's like I. Just just tell him what he wants me to say. This, yeah. Yeah, I got some uh, stenosis there at L3, L4, some mild degenerative disc and, disease. And he has a little dragon dictation tool and just oh says my. like says like Apple One, you know, and then it, and it fills the macro and then. Oh, I love it! I love it! You lazy fucker! He's not even typing it up. He's just no. going right to the right to the cue cards. You know, and he's like, we would vote, and of course I had to sit in and like watch like him read images, and then we we're both laughing at how ridiculous. So he's in on the joke. Yeah, he's in okay, on the joke of it. how ridiculous he's this all, whole thing. But he's, dude, he's the girl at the the um, the appraisal agency that's yeah. going like when Steve Carell goes off on her. Yeah, it's like really everyone without everyone who has a boss doesn't have a moral obligation to this planet. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, I don't know. It's tough because like, where do you draw the line? And it's interesting that like back to the healthcare thing mm. that I feel like the conversations are happening in the wrong places. Mm. Like we spend so much time and effort in news and press on. Facebook and like Facebook and Instagram, like with privacy laws and, and, and monitoring your, your traffic and all that, where it's like, can we have a conversation about healthcare data? Yeah. I feel like a conversation around healthcare, healthcare data will yield so much more value, right? For what you're giving up. What are you giving up? I don't give a fuck. Right, like, I, what do what do you what do I care if like some I, someone knows that I wear contact lenses or something? Mm. There's no bearing on my life. Yeah. So, but the funny thing is, you know, for Facebook's kind of Negative externalities. One of the things they do really well is their AI research um, uh, group uh, does some of the most extensive healthcare research. Really, they have, they have some of the largest kind of workable but then, medical I mean, data sets. And I think that's and, just, that's a that's and, an opportunity. And though, they right? work and they yeah and they work with the they work with you know NYU and Jan LeCun is the guy who first published the paper on Convenets. You know, is is working kind of this joint venture with NYU and and Fair, and you know they they've kind of produced some of the biggest big breakthroughs in in kind of AI for medical imaging. I guess at the end of the day, 
it's almost like, uh, like and also they're building the tools that everyone is is building these systems on, right? It's because that's where the money is. Yeah, it was like only Facebook has has the, the resources and the incentive to build open source machine learning tooling, right? right. At the at the very low level, like the C plus plus code that the Python calls to do gradient descent fast, right? To 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 update to do calculus very fast, right? Because that's the level of, of granularity that you need to write very efficient machine learning code. And someone needs to sit down and write the C plus plus and optimize it and make sure that the math form that the formula, you know, on the on the on the whiteboard gets implemented in code and it does it in a in a CPU and memory efficient way, and right? which anyone, is really 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 hard. I was gonna say if anyone who's <laughs> ever looked at a single line of C plus plus code, you want to just punch yourself in the face repeatedly until it goes away. Yeah, yeah. It's it, what's well, it, it's good to see, and it's like it's kind of sad to see that it's like money has to be the driving factor in. Mm in pushing forward the healthcare industry because mm -hmm. like with this COVID stuff like to me it's like the we kind of talked about this in uh with a few people about the business side of like COVID if you had a bad business that was going to fail in five years it's kind of cliched now it failed in five months right mm -hmm. if you had a good business that was going to do well in five years it did better in five months mm -hmm. right but it's like the, I think the biggest business that failed during COVID was healthcare business across the world right like if you have an emergency room that only has three beds and two of those beds have COVID cases or three of those beds have COVID cases, well, it's like, guess what? Screenings for other things are getting pushed aside and everyone has to stay at home because if you go out and tear your ACL, you're just going to sit with a torn ACL because mm -hmm. these three beds are taken. Yeah. Right? But it's, it's sad that it took something like this to incentivize a improvement to the healthcare system across the world because that business, albeit super successful in the sense that like insurance companies and, and pharmaceutical companies make well, a ton of money. Well, healthcare is full of fat margins and administrative burdens. And, right. You know. Dude, I got, <laughs> I had to get eye drops when I was in North Carolina because I scratched my cornea with my contact and I waited four hours and I got like an $800 bill and I was like, what? How is this a thing? I thought someone with COVID got like, I don't know, those, those, of course these all these absurd hospital right. bills that get negotiated down by carriers but if you end up being stuck with the bill, it's like $3 million for two weeks or something. You know. Dude, if I'm spending three million dollars in two weeks, I'm going yeah. out in like a cloud full like, of cocaine. It was like the IV, like the saline is like is ten thousand dollars or something, you know? And it's like, what? It's like salt water, but it's, like the, it's just the way they negotiate with it, with care with insurance, you know, carriers, and it always gets negotiated down. But there, but there's such a bureaucracy that sometimes that bill gets through to the to the, the right individual. to the payer. Yeah, it's like yeah. a three million dollar yeah. bill. Enjoy your ten thousand dollar saline. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, and let's double this back and talk about hybrid now because yeah. um, we are sitting in Steffi's office. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure Hayden does work here too, but well, it's it's cool to see that. I mean, in the conversation around healthcare, things like Peloton. Right, mm -hmm. things like hybrid now, mm -hmm. like with like the amount of reach you guys have, and with Matt Fraser's new program coming out. That I like Peloton and hybrid being in the same conversation, dude. We <laughs> we went out to dinner the other day, and uh -huh. we were celebrating what I think to be a monumental occasion in the fitness industry. Like I think yeah. with the Fraser program coming out, I think with what you're doing, it's different, right? It's not just kids selling spreadsheets online anymore. This is the most sophisticated operation in fitness by far. Right, and you're not selling three thousand dollar bikes yet. I'm sure that's coming, but it's no, it's cool to see because if the fundamental issue around all of this COVID crap was a failed healthcare system, and that mm. we've been spending too much time and energy and resources in other parts governing and oversight of security and information and protection around data, that's like you're the cat meme pages you follow. Mm. It's like maybe there's a conversation to preemptively strike the real strain on the economy, which was. It's always the fat people that are wearing three masks and telling you to put your mask on. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, now here you have hybrid that's bringing scalable exercise solutions and can do can start to use some of these more sophisticated models to help reach more people. Yeah, so the idea, right, it's like, you know, it's using, you can use science for good or for evil, right? Right, you can... You're like, the, you know what you are? You're well, the Oppenheimer of fitness. Yeah, yeah. Did you guys right. go to the same school? <laughs> None, no, but I know where you went to school. In New I York. know. I thought you. Know, I swear. I was talking to Steph. I'm like, I'm pretty sure Cap and Oppenheimer went to the same school in New York. <laughs> he lived on the uh, Upper West Side. No. You know what? It's uh, funny. Do you I, have you ever read his book, American Prometheus? Yeah, like in high school. It's amazing. There's yeah. a story. So I used to live close to when he was out in uh, UC Berkeley. Uh -huh. I used to work pretty close to where he was at, and he said he was out on a date once, mm -hmm. and he was with a girl. I'm assuming he was an incredibly awkward human being. 
to all accounts, like he's everything you want him to be as yeah. the guy who made the atomic bomb. Yeah. But he took this girl out on this hike, like Grizzly Peak or something out in Berkeley, and he for, forgot something in his car, and he ended up. Uh, oh, I gotta go back. I gotta get something with his glasses or some shit. Mm. And as he was walking, he started to think about some sort of physics thing. And he got in his car and drove home. Yeah. <laughs> and he went and he left this girl on like Grizzly Peak. <laughs> and the girl like went like to the cops and was like, he like left. And like, I don't know if he got like, there's mountain lions out there. He's like, yeah. maybe he got fucking mauled by a cougar or something. And then they like went to his house to go check. And he's just like sitting by candlelight, like writing some stuff down about <laughs> physics. And he goes, oh, I suppose I was on a date. <laughs> Is she okay? All right, carry on as you were. <laughs> And it's just like, man, what a brilliant human being. Yeah. We need people like that. Yeah. But yeah, it's just um, with what you guys are doing, like, right. I don't think people realize yeah. what you do on a day to day to bring hybrid to the masses. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, then you know that you're doing something right, right? You need to hide. Well, no, that that's why I'm putting thing. you on a podcast. Yeah. That's why Stefan Hayden aren't here because yeah. you'll find you're the most interesting person <laughs> in hybrid. Yeah. It's like the rest of it's just boxing matches and like yeah. cool clothes, but it's like no, no, no. You're the engine, man. You're we're, the. We're just a t-shirt company, really. Right. That's <laughs> like that's like Facebook going like no, 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 no. We're just we're just a publication company. Yeah, Nothing to see well, here. We're just building the roads. We, make, we print t-shirts and ship them. But um, no, um, yeah. I think right. That's that's how you know right. Good design, right? We talk about it like you know, simplicity is harder than complexity. Right. Right. And simplicity generally hides a lot. Like well-designed simplicity. Hides a lot of complexity. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah, it's it's more work to be simple than it is to be complex. Yeah, yeah, which no. is fun. Yeah. And I think that's where that's where you lie in this equation. Both yeah. like in the work that you do and in the manner in which you do it. You're, you, I always say that you're the guy in the middle of the black hole with the flashlight. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it's cool to see because you guys just released the hard work pays off pre-sale for the program. Um, Matt Fraser, the yeah, goat. Yeah, you know he's Canadian. I know he's Canadian. Fucking right, parent, man. Parents are Olympians. Yeah, he's a great, great, great white. Knife. And I'm so stoked <laughs> that like that because there's a weird CrossFit thing with like him and uh, Froning. Yeah, that oh, like so it, good. It's almost like a more current contemporary version of Jordan versus LeBron, <laughs> where it's but I don't have a dog in the Jordan LeBron fight. Yeah, but I have a dog in the Frazier Froning fight, uh -huh. and my dog is Frazier because uh -huh. Frazier's fucking Canadian. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. So program went, a presale went up mm. uh, last week. This will go up in a week. Yeah. Um, so head over to uh, hybridperformancemethod.com slash HWPO, hard work pays off. Yeah. Um, so check out that. So it's Matt Frazier. He's just retired from CrossFit. Hmm. He's now doing programming exclusively with, and there's some added incentives too, right? Like yeah. he like talks to you and shit. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matt Frazier will talk to you if you buy this program now. Um <laughs> So the idea is if you're competing in like the CrossFit Open, which is coming up, he will, for all the people in the pre-sale, he will hop on some Zoom calls and talk strategy. That's um, so crazy. So you get three strategy calls with Matt, and Matt has never done that before. He's never even shared his workouts before. Yeah, no. So, so Matt will help you through the CrossFit Open. Yeah, the the, the which, is, which is more than forty dollars worth of value alone. I think people, so. People sell open prep guides for more than that that are just yeah, little PDFs. Exactly. Yeah. So rather than buying the next Booty Band <laughs> mini series yeah. off of your favorite IG Ho. Uh, yeah, Matt Fraser, uh, HWPO, hybridperformancemethod.com. Mm -hmm. That pre sales up now. Uh, yeah. Launches are weekly. Are we doing apparel weekly now? What are we doing here? I feel like I literally, times. I haven't done laundry since I got here. <laughs> I've just been like, hey, we got a new drop. Here's clothes. I'm like, I guess I'm wearing this now. We, we try minimum two times a month. <clears throat> so, and there's little smaller ones sprinkled throughout there. Right. And now Steffi has her own line, which has its, in, its, its own schedule. Right. It's by um, Steffi Cohen, yeah. hybrid legacy. Yeah. Now we got to the point where we actually pretty much have stuff in the store all the time, which is nice. Because I'm like, why do we sell T-shirts and not sell them sometimes? Like, I don't, I don't get the streetwear thing. You know, like, you why, know, do you so, why do you refuse to sell people T-shirts? Right, so they buy more T-shirts. <laughs> yeah. So the aftermarket supreme value of your white T-shirt with a red like logo is seven hundred dollars. Like the people want T-shirts, just give them their T-shirts. I feel like the con. You, you know what the hybrid's next move should be? Uh, a sitcom. Yeah, a sitcom, a reality show that follows the interactions of you and Steffi Cohen, because you're just sitting there like pulling the face off of humanity and reading the source code, and Steffi's like, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah. Wow, that's wild. Nothing makes I do it. catch myself getting a little bit too deep into a conversation I know she's not interested in. 
and then I like try to back out of it. No, no, no. She, <laughs> you should just you should try to see how little she's paying attention. You should just start like I used to do when my science teacher back in grade nine, Mr. Clements. He never checked our homework, but he always went through the process of walking her out. Yeah. I was like I wonder if he actually reads the shit. So I wrote out the lyrics to Stairway to Heaven <laughs> once, and I was like, "Here goes like a great job." And I was like, "I know." Once he hits the solo, I should it's just brilliant. start saying nonsense and see if she's like, "Oh, hey, oh dude, it'd be the same fucking thing." It would just start doing some of it in another language. She has no when she tunes out. Yeah. She pays zero attention to yeah. anything. Like it's just like, as you don't, she doesn't hear your voice. Mm. She hears a slight intonation that in, that infers that there's a there's a conclusion to a thought. But what's funny is that's when she posts on Instagram. What when she's not when she's not paying attention to a conversation. Oh yeah, that's when her that's where Instagram and it's scary because she posts on Instagram a lot. Yeah, and then you look at like, wait a minute, five five minutes ago, I was talking to Steph five minutes ago. <laughs> She's like, where this is me boxing. <laughs> oh shit, now we'd have to like get or, her. Or it's some like inspirational quote that she like figured out on the spot, like or Fi- she, or she Google searched or she Google whatever. Yeah, 100%. But she but she was like figure like she was like figuring out what to say. Yeah, like during a conversation, her prefrontal yeah, cortex yeah, was, was like so, occupied. It was, it was right. totally somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. It's we man. We should just do a whole podcast with trash and stuff, or not trashing stuff, but yeah, highlighting right. the many flavors, the, the quirks, the quirks, the flavors, the, the palette of emotions yeah. that is Steffi Cohen. Yeah. Uh, but no, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. It's always good to chat, especially on like your evolving expertise on the technical side. It's definitely uh, evolving. It's, it's evolving fun. very fast. <laughs> it's mutating. You're just going to be a computer. Like I just, it's you're metastasizing. Just, where's, that is one way to look at it. It's it depends on it depends on what side of the bank account you're yeah. on, I guess. But yeah. it's uh, yeah, at some point I'm going to come and where's Cap? Oh, he's plugged in in the corner. Yeah. Um, always wired in. That was like in the social network when they're in the house in Palo Alto. Yeah. I'm like always wired in. He's wired. Is that you? <laughs> no, but see, you no. Guys, you're too interpersonal in the yeah. way you have to work to be wired in. Yeah, I don't I don't get wired in very much. No, you're solar powered. Yeah. I think you're solar. That's why you live in Miami. Yeah. Um, but Cap, do appreciate the time, right. man. You're you're actually one of our most requested guests. I'm I'm happy to hear that. I like that. Yeah, no. So I mean I live here now. And I know so. you have a lot of interesting guests. I, that's a lie. That's a lie. We just talk to stupid <laughs> fitness people. So it's always interesting to break out of that man. I appreciate your time. All right.